Now, now can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, I'm Brenda Daly, Director of the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities, and I'd like to welcome you and thank you so much for coming out on this lovely evening. I didn't think I'd ever kind of complain about a lovely evening, uh, and I and I I do appreciate this Iowa weather we've been having, but I think that a lot of people would rather be outside. So I appreciate the sacrifice that you're making because I know you're in for a wonderful evening. If you've seen our posters and our first ever newsletter, you know that uh, our series this year is on the topic places, peoples, and spatial practices. I had to really pr pr practice that. <laughs> And uh, I had a, a reporter come from a um, campus magazine or a newspaper and ask, well, well, now, what does that mean, places, people, and spatial practices? That's pretty broad. And as I explained to her, we kept it that broad because we want to be as inclusive as we can. And we want this to be an experience of defining places from many different disciplinary perspectives, many different social locations. Uh, if you've had a chance to look at the series, you know that we have an architect who will be speaking to us, um, a poet, uh, a psychologist, a uh, historian of geography, and I think we've all experienced place, and so it seems so commonplace. But when you start looking at it from different perspectives, say the architect's eyes, or the farmer's eyes, or the urban planner's eyes, or maybe the eyes of a new immigrant, uh, it becomes a very complex term and fascinating to explore. We're very, very pleased to have Julie Ellison here to help us begin that exploration. And I'd like to tell you just a little bit about her. Julie is the founding director of Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in Public Life. Based at the University of Michigan, Imagining America is a national consortium that fosters the public role of the arts, humanities, and design through building new coalitions and working for structural change in higher education. That's quite an agenda, and I think it's a very important and a very timely one. I urge you, in fact, to go to the website of Imagining America. It's uh, a fascinating uh, place to find out all the different ways of many, many different universities uh, making an effort to reach out to the public and engage them. Ellison served four years as Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Michigan. She is Professor of American Culture, English, and Art and Design at the University of Michigan, where she taught, she's taught since 1980. Her undergraduate studies were at Harvard, where she graduated magna cum laude in American history and literature, and she received her PhD in English from Yale. She has served on the board of the Michigan Humanities Council, as well as the Michigan Task Force on Creativity, the Arts, and Cultural, uh, cult cultural Education. Pardon me. Her scholarly work ranges across the literature and culture of 18th and 19th century, with particular emphasis on gender, emotion, politics, and genre. I checked and the library does have her, uh, at least one book of hers, Cato's Tears, um, that I'm looking forward to reading. Her current research project is a study of World Poetry Day and other organized efforts to link poetry and democratic values. She has published poems in a number of quarterlies and magazines. Please join me in giving a very warm Iowa welcome to Julie Ellison. Well, we were having the deluge in Ann Arbor this week, so I may stay for a while. The epigraph for this talk is, a serious moment for the water is when it boils. And that's from uh, Kenneth Cook's poem, The Boiling Water. A serious moment for the water is when it boils. Leading one to think, what is a serious moment for the uh, Center for Excellence in Arts and humanities or what is the serious moment for September or any number of other questions. But the state of boiling, it seems to me, is one of the things I'm 
uh, going to be probing in, in various places. I want to thank you so much for having me and thank uh, Brenda and Laurel and Sandra Norvell for their very kind logistical help as well as helping me to understand the work of the center and the larger questions involved in this theme year on place. I'm delighted to be here. It's a pleasure and an honor. I have not come to Iowa before. Is this better? Oh, okay, a little more like this. All right, yeah, I can feel, I can hear it. I haven't come to Iowa before, but Iowa has come to me, and I'll tell that story in a little while. And I'm going to start by setting forth at some length a definition of public scholarship uh, developed through the work of this consortium of 72 colleges and universities that I direct, uh, Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in Public Life. Imagining America began in 1999, turning into a consortium in 2001, as a partner program of the White House Millennium Council, a vehicle for dialogues on important national issues such as what is the public and democratic role of the arts and humanities and what does it have to do with higher education. Imagining America is a place where the civic engagement efforts in higher ed, artists and humanists, and community groups and organizations meet. This definition of public scholarship that we are continually laboring to bring forth is a consequence of a collective experience of remapping the humanities and the arts, as well as a spark for further change. Individuals, programs, and campuses in Imagining America are coming up with new answers to the question, where are the humanities and arts? These answers arose from new geographies of practice that changed assumptions about where knowledge is made, how, and by whom. Remapping the humanities involves asking not just what is a discipline or an interdisciplinary field, but also where is a discipline? Where is literature and literary studies, or history and historical studies, or music? This definition of public scholarship has implications for many disciplines, but it is specifically crafted for artists, humanists, and designers. This definition is shaped by and suffused with concepts and practices of place, which I will be teasing out as I move through it. It represents part of Imagining America's unabashed legitimation project, the naming and claiming of the power of scholarship to which public purposes and relationships are central. After a somewhat lengthy discussion of this definition, I'm going to tell the story of how Iowa came into my life as a civic professional and public scholar entered in a way that seemed serendipitous and accidental, but which had everything to do with the quite deliberate work of networks, organizations, associations, and institutions, and the self-understanding of individuals driving these networks. That story of my Iowa encounter will focus on the 1953 Iowa Poetry Day volume, a fat, dark blue book that I saw walking by me in the hands of Julie Bailey, then from the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. The sighting occurred at the 2000 Midwest Rural Arts and Culture Conference held in America's only public university for the Finnish American community. Finlandia University, a tiny but profoundly global school, is located on the Keweenaw Peninsula sticking up into Lake Superior from Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This was the only conference I have ever attended that concluded with all participants going down to the water at the end of the bridge over the canal that bisects the peninsula and building a labyrinth out of a pile of stones that a regional community arts leader had arranged to have dumped on the site. For reasons that I'll explain soon, my work was instantly legible and not at all labyrinthine to Julie Bailey from Iowa Cultural Affairs. Her work was instantly legible to me, and that book had a kind of radiant, saturated presence for us both. I will use this Iowa story and other examples to look at three qualities or features of public scholarship, building on the definition that I start with. I'll look at place work as conceptually, structurally, imaginatively, even emotionally central to public scholarship, pointing to new forms of what Ewa Ong calls flexible citizenship and what Renato Rosaldo calls cultural citizenship. I'll look at the piecework of public scholarship projects and the implications of work in the humanities that is organized by the economy of the project. 
and I'll talk about how people are developing the infrastructure in universities for the public work of the cultural disciplines with that term public work coming from my friend and uh, collaborator on some projects, Harry Boyd at the University of Minnesota. So the definition of public scholarship, and I have to say that although this has been an intellectual project of mine for years now, it is really brought to you by a coalition of colleagues around the country. First, public scholarship is scholarly or creative work integral to a faculty member's academic area. Second, it is jointly planned, carried out, and reflected on by co-equal university and community partners. I want to pause to highlight the geography of the term community here, a geography which is uh, local, global, or local, national in potential. For example, in our corner of Southeast Lower Michigan, a county underground railroad history project ended up tracking African American families through Ann Arbor and other parts of Washtenaw County over into Ontario, sometimes back again after the Civil War, or sometimes dividing into Ontario and Michigan branches of the same family. This became a community history project with an unexpected focus on the northern border. So this, uh, uh, the, I'm going to be talking about this a lot as I go through, constantly reminding us of the, um, of the simultaneously global uh, import of the local. Finally, public scholarship yields one or more public good products. Subject to these three conditions, public scholarship may encompass artistic, design, historical, and critical work that contributes to public discourse and the formation of robust publics, often through the making of public places. Public scholarship may also include disciplinary or interdisciplinary efforts to advance public engagement in higher education itself and the reflection or research on the import of such efforts. Public good products may take diverse and plural forms, including but not limited to relationships and networks, which are important results of this work. Peer-reviewed individual or co-authored publications, other forms of writing and publication, presentations at academic and non-academic conferences and meetings, oral histories or ethnographies, interviews with or reflections by participants, program development, performances, exhibitions, installations, murals or festivals, new K-16 curricula, site designs or plans for cultural corridors, and other placemaking work and policy recommendations. I would say that some of these products are academically legible, some are not. And while we need to broaden the range of what is academically legitimate and legible in public scholarship, not all products of campus community partnerships are going to enter into academic calculations, which does not mean that they are in any way expendable. My understanding of public scholarship is organized around four key concepts, and this is sort of my key word index. The work is public, contextual, complex, and of course, cultural. Research or creative work, and, and I just want to highlight here the focus throughout in, on scholarship as research uh, 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 in, the, in the traditional sense and creative activity in the traditional sense. Um, there is a great deal of work that is fundamental to the, the, um, the initiative that Imagining America is involved in and to the civic engagement movement in higher education, which comes out of the original driving force, I think, for the, uh, for the civic engagement movement in higher education, which is the transformation of teaching through community service learning. And, and this is a very strong, uh, very uh, uh, powerful strand and really there is a loop that anybody engaged in this work engages in. It doesn't matter where you put your toe in the water. You can put your toe in the water by teaching in a different way. You can put your toe in the water by engaging in a kind of scholarly project in a different way. Either way, the other piece of the, of the puzzle, your teaching or your scholarship, will be will be inflected by that experience and will be changed. Uh, but in this talk and in a lot of the work we do, because we work so much on faculty and, w on and with faculty with on their core identity as scholars, the focus will be on this, um, on this dimension. Research or creative work uh, in this domain is jointly planned and carried out by co-equal partners, each possessing intellectual and civic agency. 
Public scholarship in the arts, humanities, and design often addresses the cultural dimensions of citizenship and access to public cultural goods. The public scholarship connects directly to the work of specific publics in specific contexts. The faculty member drawing on his or her academic or artistic field co-creates publicly consequential knowledge with non-academic collaborators who then bring their own organizational networks, community development goals, principles, languages, and political clout to the work. The public scholarship thus takes seriously the plural, fluid, and social life of knowledge. It takes literally the thing that we say all the time to each other in, on occasions like this, uh, that knowledge is socially produced. Public scholarship is explicit about the importance of intergroup and interpersonal relationships, which I have to say is not something one learns about when one is getting one's PhD in English in 1980, uh, as I did. So my social education has, uh, and my interest in groups and networks and organizational and institutional formations has come much later. This understanding of the publicness of public scholarship derives in part from the notion of public work. Public work, as defined by Harry Boyd, is the sustained effort by a mix of people who solve public problems or create goods, material or cultural, of general benefit. In, in his analysis, often working with Nan Carey, he argues that citizenship itself is not a pre-existing condition or a pre-existing place, but rather a condition or place generated in and through the everyday politics of public work. The idea of the everyday is closely related to Boyd's idea of the public and also to the idea of place. The everyday is important in the domain of theory. Uh, the everyday is part of a cluster of terms, the local, the common, the indigenous, sustainability, and even the term culture that have soared in prestige. These are core concepts of global human rights work, community cultural development funded by major foundations, civil society and empowerment strategies focused on community capacities and agency rather than lack. So the conception of the public is reframed or inflected as a value and as a project through place and the everyday. Thus public scholarship does not entail the delivery of knowledge to the public, does not take the form of tech transfer or the translation of expert knowledge into simpler terms for public audiences in the media, which is what we think of as, as public intellectual work. Although it does not involve the translation of expert knowledge into simpler terms, the arts of translation, I must say, are absolutely fundamental to it. Rather, public scholarship in this context is a strategy of knowledge production that's generated in and through faculty working with a mix of people to create knowledge that has material or cultural consequences. Far from proposing that faculty scholars become, quote, selfless service providers out to help the less fortunate, and here I'm quoting uh, David Scobie, um, formerly at the University of Michigan, now at Bates, and the Imagining America board chair. Far from proposing that faculty scholars become selfless service providers out to help the less fortunate, this approach to public scholarship grants them agency and interests as civic professionals working with peers in a community of practice and inquiry. As asset or this is still SCOBY, as asset or resource-based theories of social movements and community studies have taught, we are collaborating with partners who are themselves agents, creators, and interpreters with their own expertise and their own account of both their world and ours. This definition clarifies why public scholarship is not the same as public intellectual work or investigations of the public sphere by faculty alone. And I think we can all look back on the last decade or so and look at the boom in work with the word public in the title, work on the public sphere, work on, on a public culture, work on uh, subcultures, and um, uh, work on public space. Uh, all of which is powerful, all of which, uh, a great deal of which involves um, uh, academics talking to one another about publicness. So in addition to being public, public scholarship is also contextual. Vic Bloomfield, who was Vice President for Research at the University of Minnesota, is now Associate Vice President for Public Engagement there, distinguishes between universal and local public scholarship. 
I would say Imagining America's definition of public scholarship is weighted toward the place specific, thus not the universal, and in the universal he would put something like the Human Genome Project. It leans towards the conviction that there are no places that are not simultaneously local and global now or in the past. Uh, this is not the same thing as being general or universal. Ethnography, oral history, storytelling, documentary, photo-voiced methodologies, mapping are common strategies for public scholarship in the cultural disciplines. And there's a whole emerging skill set or, or, or cluster of literacies that go with these methodologies. Public scholarship responds to the altered relationship between the local and the global by restructuring former hierarchies of the provincial and the cosmopolitan. The lure of the local, of place and everyday life, surfaces in critical theory, human rights discourse and struggles around indigenous knowledge, site-specific art and design, and cultural policy, and in fresh understandings of how nearby cities and towns are shaped continuously by global economies and migrations. Many public scholars experience place, or the local, and I know they're not identical, as an invitation to boundary crossing, complexity, expansiveness of mind, and defamiliarization, which, Scobie concludes, constitutes a new cosmopolitanism. And I think uh, the debates around this word cosmopolitanism with Appiah's new book and, and uh, um, uh, uh, the real, real um, a debate of what it means to revisit that old phrase, citizen of the world, I, I think the sense of a, a cosmopolitanism of grounded cultural work um, uh, is particularly important to, to dismantle that hierarchy that is built into academic evaluation systems in which the national and international reputation always uh, displaces the regional or provincial reputation. This is why we see a growing area of public scholarship that is defined by both local and translocal commitments. So public scholarship is complex, and sometimes when I think about complexity, I talk for a long time about the ways in which it is complex, um, and I will say something about that. But uh, there are other days when I think it's really no more complex than anything else we do in places like the University of Michigan or Iowa State. Uh, which are really good at sustaining complex enterprises. Although it's not inherently more complex than other interdisciplinary and collaborative practices, public scholarship is complex in different ways. Public scholarship fosters projects involving plural sites and organizations. It's grounded in multidisciplinary teams made up of people with different skills and ways of talking, and that multidisciplinarity does not, is not just the kind of multidisciplinary you get on campus. It is a multidisciplinary that reaches across uh, many domains off campus. It yields multiple products that fall into academic and non-academic genres. Participants speak the language of critique and reflection, which are academically intelligible, and hope, which often is not academically intelligible. So this is my new passion. Humanists can do both critique and hope, and still be smart. <laughs> very, very um, effortful uh, balancing act. Public scholarship projects may simultaneously pursue all the university's several missions. So in a single project, there could be a teaching strand, a research strand, and a service strand. They pose logistical problems, especially involving transportation and scheduling. Above all, public scholarship involves relational labor, patience with process, nimble responses to unexpected opportunities, and sustained periods of uncertainty. For all of these reasons, people who do public scholarship, as well as people charged with evaluating it, rightly perceive it as complex, though it's really not any more complex than some of our other activities. In the arts and humanities, with weak traditions of project-based teaching and scholarship and creative work, complexity of this kind can be startling, and it is really no longer rare. And finally, the word cultural, which of course one could talk about for months. Uh, we're focusing on public scholarship in the cultural discipline, so cultural is an inescapable term in our definition, both in the sense of the, uh, the narrow definition of culture as having to do with the uh, with uh, the making of the aesthetic uh, and culture in its anthropological sense. 
Culture, as Raymond Williams famously observed, is one of the two or three most complicated words in the English language. Uh, I just want to use this term to bring the work of humanists, and designers, and artists together under the common rubric of the social production of knowledge and culture uh, with a small c, culture as what we do and what we are, as my friend Ishmael Ahmed would say. Some concepts and theories relating to culture are especially prominent in public scholarship in the arts, humanities, and design. The idea of cultural agency or culture as agency is particularly important. Agency, as George Udise argues, is never wholly one's own. He goes on, it requires working in a range of groups and organizations. We see this view of agency in the concept of cultural democracy, quote, emphasizing pluralism, participation, and equity within and between cultures. It appears, too, in the work of Ben Habib on why equality and diversity are central to the claims of culture, as well as cultural citizenship initiatives. You are probably familiar with the work on Latino cultural citizenship by people like um, Renato Rizaldo. The term cultural citizenship, the concept of cultural citizenship, is also deployed by uh, UNESCO, by the European Union, and by a number of other uh, 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 NGO and government formations. This analysis of public scholarship, then, reflects important cumulative changes in how organizations and institutions throughout our society understand knowledge. We've grounded our work in Imagining America in the premise that knowledge is created in diverse, distributed, and social ways. Public engagement is an epistemological challenge. We're building ideas about knowledge creation that then are influenced by the theory of, for example, multiple intelligences, by the creativity boom that we see in arts education and in schools of management, and by investigations of complex knowledge coming out of organizational studies by people like uh, Haridi Mostsukas and Gibbons. Far from abstract, these discourses of complexity, creativity, and culture are affecting in good and bad ways, K-12 schooling, business and leadership education, cultural policy, urban economic development aimed at encouraging the creative class, and arguments over who owns information. So our use of these terms itself um, is by no means proprietary in education, and, um, uh, and even as we use them to define something like public scholarship for our academic purposes, uh, we have to understand that they are shared in, and um, reframed constantly in, uh, in many other institutional domains. So with apologies for the length of this section of the talk, this establishes at least in a loose way, the framework and the kind of vocabulary for the rest of the evening, and I hope not too abstract and general a fashion. And now, to reward you for your patience in, in, in putting up with these long preliminaries, I can tell you my Iowa story. And so, um, uh, which really involves the, the biography of a book. And what is this going to tell us about place, and what is it going to tell us about public scholarship? At this point, I'm going to shift from public scholarship to public scholars, including me, Julie Bailey from the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, who's no longer with that office, but was at the time, and the women who asserted themselves through poetry as, excuse me, as cultural agents in Iowa in 1953. I'll use this anecdote to unpack the relationships that define the experience of civic professionals and the cultural disciplines, people who are working across institutional boundaries and often quite contagiously across regional boundaries. I was handed the history of Poetry Days at a regional conference on rural arts and culture, convened by the Midwestern contingent of a group of exasperated arts and culture types who felt that national organizations, including uh, the NEA and other national arts organizations, just were not getting it. For example, funding for rural arts institutions and project tended to be framed as traditional preservationists and often as nostalgic, as in saving the past. While funding for major urban arts institutions focused on creativity, the cutting edge, the aesthetic, and the individual artist as an agent of the new. This agenda uh, of this this um, of this conference was sometimes tacit, sometimes explicit either analytically explicit or emotionally explicit through a kind of impatience or crabbiness. And of course, this was not a, a, always a matter of general consensus around this you know, critique either. 
Uh, but this was the impetus that had brought the Rural Arts and Culture Network into being with its claims to seriousness and um, standing in the arts uh, economy uh, and had led to this event. The conference is held in Hancock, uh, Michigan, um, uh, up there on the northernmost part of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and hosted by Finlandia University, the country's only higher ed institution serving the Finnish American uh, uh, immigrant community, and as such a place strongly grounded in local identities as well as in the transatlantic history of immigration. Finlandia has an active program of international exchanges, especially focused on design. Finland's head of state had just visited when we were there. Bill Ivey, the conference keynote, and then the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, had attended middle school next door. There was an art installation on the yard at the school. Cultural centers and institutions throughout the town were co-hosts, leading tours of grand restored theaters, community arts centers, and on-site installations. I took an informal poll, and a third to a half of the participants had some relationship to a college or a university. Either they taught at one, or they ran a, say, a theater facility at one, or they were employed by one in some other capacity, or they collaborated with one, especially around the use of, of facilities in some of these uh, smaller communities, uh, or some other some other connection. However, higher education was never mentioned. I kept trying to mention it, but it was really never mentioned as uh, in, in this conference that was all about uh, new collaborations and how you, uh, you know, what are the, what are the, um, uh, the resources that people bring to bear on, on this work or the uh, dilemmas of partnership. This was an invisible reality. The occasion was crafted to push the values of the Rural Arts Network, and this made even our host campus, Finlandia, invisible as a university due to its other meaning as home to a gallery, home to some important collections, and home to several faculty artists and designers who clearly were seen to be more like participants in a local arts network than bearers of the university's institutional identity. I was present at this Rural Arts Conference not because I was a faculty member at the University of Michigan, but because I was a member of the board of the Michigan Humanities Council. Julie Bailey, the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, walked by me at the conference carrying this 1953 Iowa Poetry Day volume, which she was toting around uh, as a kind of material icon, I think, of the imaginative ambition of Iowa. Uh, not knowing who she was, uh, I insisted anyway that she just hand this book over to me on the spot, <laughs> which began our conversation. I ended up taking the book home with her blessings and photocopying it, sending it back to her, and starting to pour over the Xerox. So one answer to the question, where is literary studies, or where is literature as a discipline, is at the Rural Arts and Culture Conference in the history of Iowa poetry, including uh, the history of Iowa poetry being carried forward by the current poet laureate, uh, Ted Kuser, who's working, I think, very much in this tradition, and in the class that I taught for many years on the poetry of everyday life, with partners ranging from third graders and their superb teacher, Chris Maxey Reeves, the co-project leader, high school performance poets in Ann Arbor's famous volume poetry project, and the public library. The Imagine Iowa Cultural Plan, which is what uh, Julie Bailey was working on at the time, about to launch a statewide series of, of uh, uh, deliberations, uh, was a process before it was a plan. It was unfolding right at that moment in 2000 and 2001. Uh, and they, those folks, it turned out, knew about Imagining America and about our online resource called Imagining Your State, which we were uh, laid forth a, a, a plan for uh, a state level alliances between say, humanities councils, state arts councils, and all higher ed institutions at the state, uh, in, in the state. Um, and we were piloting that model in Michigan uh, under the auspices of our Imagining Michigan program. I can say more about this later if you're interested. Uh, but um, she knew about that and acknowledged that the word imagine and imagine Iowa had uh, had been picked knowingly, um, uh, uh, in part because uh, it resonated with an enterprise already underway as a national model. 
Imagine Iowa was a well-crafted, deliberate policy-setting conversation that stands as a nice example of a strategy for public and community engagement into which university artists and scholars can enter. Another excellent citizen project, not with the specifically cultural focus, is Minnesota Works Together, which is currently underway. I know that we have some Minnesotans in the room. So one of the things that was happening was that Julie Bailey from Iowa and Julie Ellison from Michigan were connecting under the sign of the imagination, imagining your state, imagining America. Um, our encounter had a double resonance for me as a scholar, but could not have happened without the public cultural enterprise, because of course without pre-existing investments, I never would have made it under the State Humanities Council Board, which became a key adult learning group for me and got me to the conference in Hancock. So what about Iowa, you're thinking? This is where the importance of the book as a scholarly and as a civic artifact comes in. The first four pages, so you have to visualize this, the first four pages of this 217 page hardcover publication display full page biographical sketches with formal photographic portraits. Uh, and when I say formal portraits, the, the portraits themselves are formal photographs and the women are in formal dress. Of the women who served as chairman, founder, organizer, and permanent director, and co-chairman of the Iowa National Poetry Day Committee, and as president of the Iowa Poetry Day Association. The combined literary and musical affiliations, for example, of poet-composer Agnes Veronica Flannery, the chairman, are typical of all four women, and indeed of much of the state and national leadership of Poetry Day organizations in that era. So here is Flannery's bio, and note the number of times the word national appears in this bio. 17 words and music compositions published. Winner of many prizes in poetry and music, including several national awards. Listed in poetry magazines, newspapers, periodicals, and more than 100 anthologies. Organized Alpha Chapter Des Moines of the Poetry Society of Iowa 1935. Joined National League of American Pen Women in 1935 and served as National Radio Chairman 1942 to 1944 served as Iowa State President of Composers, Authors, and Artists of America in 1948-49, organized Des Moines chapter of CAAA in October 1949, elected chairman of the National Board of Directors in 1950, member of the National Poetry Society of America, American Poetry League, the Poets' Haven, Iowa Authors Club, established the Des Moines National Poetry Center, made an honorary member of the Eugene Field Society in 1942, honorary member of the International Mark Twain Society, honorary corresponding member of the Institut Littéraire de France of Paris, France in 1942. Marcella Rossiter's bio is, I'm sorry to say, impossible to read without laughing. And um, uh, it's, not, it's not as long. It has some of the same kinds of affiliations. And then it says, Marcella was named Colonel of the Iowa Tall Corn by press columnists of Iowa for outstanding work as Iowa Poetry Day Association Secretary. She received recognition for her Singing Box, a collection of hand-worked books for shut-in children by being chosen Iowa Woman of the Week on the Tall Corn Radio Network. So the Tall Corn, I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's polite to make Iowa jokes in Iowa, but with, I'm only quoting and Iowans themselves, so oh, perhaps I can be uh, forgiven. And both of these biographical sketches, sketches, and there are more, are manifestations of an absolutely palpable craving for visible and elaborated organizational structure that could legitimate female leadership and professionalization. One sees, especially in the connection between the role of the civic professional connecting with state legislators and public ceremonies with that of the cultural professional. My colleague, historian Mary Kelly, quotes a student at a 19th century female academy who exclaimed of her educational labors, it makes me feel so busy and so consequential. This from a member of the generation of women students who were told by their teachers, and this is another quote from Mary, you are going to school for society in order to arrive at distinguished usefulness. 
the formal performances and ceremonies of learning conducted at such female academies and at the first women's colleges helped create the ethos that we see here in 1953, a hundred years later, in the cultural institution of working women aspiring to professionalism in the cultural economy in the Midwest. The National Federation of Press Women, Composers, Authors, and Artists of America, in which women were prominent, the National League of American Pen Women, the Poetry Society of America, each had its state and sometimes regional subgroups. The national state local structure is quite interesting and important for reasons that Theda Scottbull has set forth in her book, Diminished Democracy, where she looks at a similar structure in, for example, um, uh, the Elks or the Rotaries, the, 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 um, the way that people would belong in their hometown to a regional and national structure that in fact had some considerable uh, political uh, uh, clout or at least conversation with government entities. So these, so these organizations, uh, we, we know for men and clearly for women, organize the relationships between Americans, their, their governments, uh, in this case state governments, and their associational life. These were significant peer networks for professional women making a living through culture, sometimes a tenuous living and sometimes only marginally professional, as the references to small local performance venues sometimes indicate. And I have to say I'm particularly moved by this because I'm so involved in legitimation enterprises myself that, that I think I've now become developed antenna around the, the, uh, the, the, the pressure um, uh, of claiming uh, you know, of, of, of claiming legitimacy through networks, which sometimes feel that on a daily basis that's something I do quite a lot of myself. On page one of this volume, there's a list of congressional district and county chairmen because, of course, Iowa Poetry Day was organized by congressional district. The organizational structure of Iowa Poetry Day mirrors the legislative map of the state, reinforcing the civic dimension. Legislative districts corresponded to counties at a time when counties were fundamental springs of personal community and civic identity. A page thanking contest patrons is followed by the text of the governor's Poetry Day proclamation and then 200 pages of poems, many of them contest winners in different categories and then other submissions. My encounter with this Iowa Poetry Day volume introduced me to the history of the Poetry Day movement of the U.S. and then the world, and I will restrain myself from giving that other paper in which I tell about the origin of the U.S. state Poetry Day movement, uh, started by the remarkable Tessa Sweezy Webb in Columbus, Ohio in 1938 by act of the state legislature. Webb was a poet and poetry activist. Her day job was as the financial staff person in the Ohio State University Extension Program, linking poetry to the history of land-grant education in another way. This line of investigation took me to recent proclamations by UNESCO developments in the UK and Morocco, and, uh, and on and on around this question of poetry days, and made me look differently at the poetry collections in our own historical archive at uh, the Bentley Historical Library on our campus. I will pull back from the brink of that other talk, however, in order to sum up what this counter did for my scholarship. Because I was already working with poetry center, community-based, and public projects, the dignity and historical weight of what these women were trying to accomplish erased the reaction I would have had as a newly minted PhD from Yelp, which I think would have been probably to laugh. But I never would have seen the complexity of community poetry projects had I not also put in 10 years of research and teaching devoted to reclaiming the marginalized writing of sentimental, gothic, lyric, and storytelling poets of the 18th and 19th century. These two realities reinforced each other, the literary archive that feminist scholars were re rehabilitating, and the closely related tradition of civic poetry projects that had had a much stronger commitment to building organizational networks around artistic genres. Only when I, was, when I was running an organizational network myself, i.e. Imagining America, did this last set of meetings reveal themselves. I don't, where am I in time? Um, about 45 minutes. Oh, okay, so I, I will in fact scan, you know, this, forgive me, this is gonna run over. <laughs> um, 
I um I have a lovely story by David Scobie about uh, about uh, encountering a um, an item in a collection in Lewiston, Maine, a, a and a concert program signed um, best wishes Maurice Chevalier and since he's now working with the francophone community in Maine he talked about how he had this geeky scholarly moment with all of his you know his historian questions clustered around this object and he uses that to talk about um, uh, about how public scholars have to uh, have to really um, energetically own the research and um, uh, uh, the kind of creative inquiry strand of engagement, um, as well as the service strand. Here I'm going to go through these ideas of place work, peace work, and public work. Um, and I wanted to give some more examples of place work. Here are th three examples, and I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. Um, and you'll see that they're mediated by different kinds of university infrastructure, one by a department, one by a university-wide community engagement program, and one by a humanities institute. Here's the first one. At the University of Houston, the Women's Studies Department created a Friends of Women's Studies group, made up largely of professional women in the Houston area, interested in the work of the Women's Studies program. Together, they raised the funds to build an archive that documents the history of individual women and women's organizations in Houston. This project connects the intellectual undertaking of the Women's Studies Program to research that their local partners want and need through a long-term joint enterprise of funding, collecting, scholarship, and presentation. And it puts the Friends of Women's Studies into collaboration with the historical, comparative, and interpretive powers of feminist scholars. This archive reached sufficient scope to require housing in the university archive, and the same partnership of women's studies faculty and the Friends Group raised additional money to fund half of an archivist position, the University of Houston Library, in order to manage the collection. And they went on to raise money for a fellowship, and it now supports a doctoral student's use of the archive in her research. Second example, the Field School of Heritage Battle Creek in Battle Creek, Michigan. It's a project that connected the organization uh, Heritage Battle Creek with the Arts of Citizenship Program at the University of Michigan, a platform for campus community partnership in the arts, humanities, and design. The summer field schools train citizen scholars, people in the community who are, in, who are already actively involved in, in, um, in uh, historical uh, research and uh, preservation, in techniques for researching local history and architecture. Particular emphasis for the first field school was one on an African American urban culture, was on African American urban culture of the mid 20th century in Battle Creek. Heritage Battle Creek is headed by Michael Evans, former journalist, creator of the Sojourner Truth Memorial and the Sojourner Truth Institute in Battle Creek. And Michael operated with firm rule, no drive by research in my town. Evans worked with two graduate students funded by our graduate school. Uh, they were designated Civitas Fellows. Other partners in the Summer Field School were Western Michigan University and Kellogg Community College. The community scholars continued to meet and have proposed a certification program for oral transcriptionists available for any group undertaking an oral history or ethnographic project. Third example, the Institute on Race, Ethics, and the Modern Experience at Rutgers, Newark, directed by Professor Clement Price. Rutgers, along with the Newark Museum, stayed in Newark in the 60s and 70s when other institutions and businesses vacated the cities. The Institute's research-related activities include the following. Supportive faculty engage in research on the social construction of difference and community history and memory projects. A postdoc nurtures recent, recent PhDs towards scholarly productivity and engagement with the city of Newark. A civic fellows program that brings civic leaders onto campus for a semester-long seminar with faculty members. Public programs that encourage freedom of speech, inquiry, and fellowship, that's their language, among a cross-section of citizens. And finally, seminars on racial and ethnic diversity for all 2007 members of the New Jersey State Police in the aftermath of revelations about, systematic, about systemic racial profiling. Out of these programs, faculty at the center are developing a new American Studies doctoral program, which will be community-based with an urban focus and a new kind of arts major. And I just want to put in a plug for the Imagine America Conference, which is coming up on October 6th, 7th, and 8th in 
over the way in Columbus, Ohio, our theme is engaging through place, and there will be an array of, um, of reflections and presentations um, with, uh, coming out of additional work of this kind. The research is central to public scholarship, and this is not said often enough in the broad public engagement movement in higher ed, which, as I said earlier, was galvanized by community-based teaching above all. Universities cannot make knowledge by themselves. The public sphere is not a pre-existing location or a state of being that we study or step into. There's an important trend focusing on learning organizations, and universities can be and should be the ultimate learning organizations. This means the faculty who love to learn, and why would one become a faculty member? Because you to keep learning. We'll learn from collaborators through the medium of the project, and we'll learn, as I did, in ways that affect their sense of themselves as scholars. So place in these projects is always social, accessed and understood through coalitions, contexts, and conversations. Richard Bodden, an Australian plant scientist with an influential theory of learning, inspirational learning, says that we come to see the world differently through community practice. The power of public scholarship to reframe what we thought we knew is palpable. And this reframing is perhaps most powerful in intercultural work. Cultural disciplines are receptive to and invested in movements aimed at cultural and social transformation at the local level here and around the world. Thus, translocal scholarship that mediates between deeply rooted regional or local projects and larger communities of practitioners and theorists offers a particular kind of interdisciplinary excellence. I'm not going to go through the piecework section. I use the word piecework because the word piece can mean a bounded piece of land or a defined time or space, which seemed right. But it also means, of course, paid by the piece, scrounging for resources and impoverished as a rule. Uh, piecework points to the hand-to-mouth existence of community cultural organizations and underfunded humanities departments and also to the struggle to assemble resources for this kind of uh, project which is still unconventional in terms of support systems. Collaboration can be fostered by passing the hat among a dozen struggling organizations but there really are better ways. Um, public scholarship tends to at, the, at this project level has a both-and structure which can combine micro scale with macro claims to meaning so that you will have big ideas and sometimes quite bounded or, or uh, finite uh, projects with a small number of people in, a, in over a, say, semester. Um, so these projects can be very large in their aspirations. They can be about democracy or about citizenship or about place. And I think one of the defining features of this work right now is the sometimes nervous negotiation between uh, logistics on the one hand and uh, dreams on the other. Here I just want to underscore the importance of the project um, and count the number of times I've used project in this talk. The project often becomes the basis for the work identity of public scholars and artists. The project is the provocation for and subject of writing, publication, and presentation. The project is the focus of funding infrastructure. And project teams are spatially mobile, moving between places, roles, and rhetorics. So a public scholarship project requires a goal-oriented, time-delimited team of campus and community collaborators who work together. And um, in many fields, this is not news. I mean, uh, the social sciences, many of the, of the professions, and many design fields urban studies, landscape architecture, the organization of work around projects is completely unremarkable. But in the cultural disciplines and above all in the humanities, the project is not the norm and it represents a new structure, which, um, uh, which is um, why I spend so much time linking place, publicness, and projects in this discussion. I'm going to wind up with just a final comment on public work and the care and feeding of public scholars and artists. Projects beget programs and centers. This is the, you know, the, the evening of the center. It seems to me we need to talk about centers a little bit here at the end. And centers in turn nurture partnerships and projects. This center can be part of a family of institutes that sustain collaborative projects with public and community partners. And these, my list 
not definitive, would include the Simpson Center at the University of Washington, the Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience at Rutgers Newark, which I mentioned, the Public Humanities Institute at the University of Texas, Austin. Syracuse is inaugurating a humanities center focused on public scholarship, and so is Florida. Emory has had a center for the study of public scholarship, which focuses on public cultural institutions for some time. There are numerous examples of other forms of university investment in public, excuse me, in public scholarship that support and in many cases evolved from individual projects. At Michigan State, the Public Humanities Faculty Collaborative is linked to a new residential college and a new graduate certificate program. The Humanities Out There program, otherwise known as HOT, at the University of California, Irvine, gives graduate students in the humanities an opportunity to integrate their research into engagement in K-12 through schools. And there are new graduate degree programs at research universities in community-based cultural studies, community-based American studies, and community-based theater. The Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation's report on the response of PhD predicted that these programs are attracting strong interest among engaged graduate students in the humanities and arts. So for my generation, and I think for, for, for several generations after me, uh, project-based public scholarship was not possible until after tenure, but there is a group of people in the pipeline who don't want to wait and are making themselves heard. I hope these examples have helped bring the network I work with of 72 campuses alive for you as a national community and resource. We do conferences, publications, research, and policy. We have a program called PAGE, Publicly Active Graduate Education, and more. Above all, Imagine America is one of the networks of the kind I've been talking about that are fundamental to the social and citizenly making of publicness, a network rooted in many places, in many publics, and in the pursuit of intercultural connection. And I want to close by quoting a recent opinion piece called Toward the Practice of the Humanities, in which Evan Carton of, and Sylvia Gale at the University of Texas Humanities Institute uh, talk about their work in a quite forceful way. Sylvia, I should say, is the founding director of our publicly active graduate education program. They call for a new understanding of the humanities, quote, as a common site and practical instrument of social production. They talk about how they reframed their analysis of the humanities, quote, learn to see the world differently, at a parking lot discussion following a meeting on the topic of what if all of Austin reads the same book. They asked in that parking lot, what if all of Austin writes the same book? This resulted in a citywide life writing and community discovery project with 800 submissions that resulted in a 400 page anthology of stories in English and Spanish and a new collection donated to the local history center's archive. It also, this chain reaction also led to the creation of, um, of sabbaticals for community leaders at the Humanities Institute uh, funded by the university and an array of other innovations. Protesting the way in which the humanities are, quote, confined to the province of values or to the role of post hoc interpretation and critique, they call for something different. And because this is likely to be controversial, I close with their assertion, with which I um, concur. The humanities must be recast and rearticulated as a social practice, a practice not confined to interrogating social arrangements, but involved in making them. Thanks. So it's probably still really nice out there, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. As long as other people can hear you, or I can repeat your question. Stand up because I'm long. You're good. Okay. Um, I'm curious about the relationship between public scholarship and what you might call more traditional humanities scholarship. Because it seems to me, I, I know here at Iowa State, humanities uh, people have trouble sort of uh, finding a place for themselves in a, a corporate style institution in which, you know, the, the, how much money you bring in is what your value is. It seems to me that the focus on practicality in the, the public scholarship uh, description that you just gave in some ways 
this plays into this, which is that the humanities are there to sort of service the public, and it still leaves out what some of us do that is much more traditional scholarship. Yeah, and it's, I mean, that's, that's, uh, th those are great questions, and there's actually the, 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 the intersection between, and contest between uh, uh, some, some of these strands is just really interesting and important, and um, uh, there are people like George Udise who are actually talking about the use value of the humanities and, 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 and this question, and, it, and, and the question of usefulness of work and of practice, um, and whether or not they mean the same things as entrepreneurialism or corporate or being valued in terms of your grants, I think are very different. Um, uh, I, because, in fact, the, uh, the kind of use I'm talking about I I includes, um, uh, includes things that um, would not be legible as, um, as uh, I, I think, for example, necessarily contributing to the economic resurgence of uh, the region they can they they are they include um, uh, they include oral histories that get translated into performance by uh, for example Detroit mosaic uh, children's theater uh, uh, they they uh, they include they they sometimes include very um, very specific kinds of responses to sites which can which which can include doing deep histories of those sites uh, involving involving interviewing and family histories and um, uh, as well as archival work, which then lead to uh, having an impact on debates about the uses of public spaces, for example, in cities. But many much of this work involves expressive culture, including in, including work with um, uh, with youth. Um, uh, arts groups, for example, uh, the work with K through 12 schools. Uh, there's a lot of debate about that. George Sanchez wrote a piece for us that we published last year. He's director of ethnic and American studies at uh, at um, USC and and we're, and works in Latino studies. And he he was talking about the tension between the civic engagement pressure, you know, which he totally supports in higher education, and the retreat from uh, affirmative action policies, which which confront racial and ethnic inequalities directly. And, and he was talking about how uh, the idea of having thousands of USC students working to, for example, provide music education in schools that no longer have music programs is a kind of Band-Aid operation and that one could absolutely challenge as not helpful <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, helping, helping a broken system. Uh, limp along. At, th at the same time, his project, the Boyle Heights project, focused on creating intercultural, s intercultural connections where there were none, where you had a highly divided city with silos uh, of, of a neighborhood that had been Jewish and then Japanese and then Latino, um, and, uh, and where people had strong memories of a connection to that neighborhood and never talked to the other groups that had serials, serially occupied that space. Um, uh, and uh, that had huge reper uh, repercussions. So I think the question of usefulness certainly needs to be framed around the usefulness of expressiveness, the usefulness of uh, the kind of thing that the Ford funded Animating Democracy Initiative uh, focused on. It was not it did not involved universities necessarily. It was very interesting uh, work around dealing with um, with community differences through artistic practice. So uh, so I think that um, uh, so I think that. The challenge is to find exactly that place in the scholarship uh, where it where it intersects with um, uh, with the project that needs that that needs that knowledge um, and that also transforms that knowledge. And I think that was what was happening to me with the Iowa Poetry Day book. That is, there was a there was a complete fusion of, of a kind of um, of a, 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 of a um, uh, of trying to move along certain policy initiatives and institutional and organizational changes relating to culture and um, uh, work that was deeply invested in the layered making of poetry in history, in American history. And uh, it, I think it's, is that, I think that was happening with David Scobie and the Maurice Chevalier <laughs> a piece where all of a sudden 
um, uh, his his usefulness had to do completely with his ability to, to frame questions that nobody else. Other people were framing all kinds of questions about that object. He brought a different set of questions, and it paid off for him, and it was a huge contribution uh, to the project. And that, I think, is the kind of question of use. I will say something about work, and, and I think that there is um, there's tremendous anxiety in the people who are trying to advance liberal learning. You know, there's a whole liberal learning push and an organization I admire greatly, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, is pushing liberal learning in the liberal arts tradition of, um, uh, of education that is in fact explicitly not designed to send people out to get jobs. And they, get, they do these polls of undergraduates and they expose undergraduates to their definition of liberal learning and then they ask them questions again about their understanding of liberal learning and they still keep saying what they want out of college education is they want to go out and get a job. And I actually think it's a real mistake. I'm for that. I actually think if you don't go to college and you want to go out and get paid for doing work you love, that is a place to start. And I think, yeah, I, I think the question of uh, work in our culture and of what work people can do and under under what circumstances of economic dignity they can do it that is an that's an aspiration in from our, in in our state um, uh, government leaders and and my state government leaders and um, uh, and uh, uh, parents and students themselves that that the that, that is that's crucial, and our interrogation of our own work I think is is fully part of that and so I don't have. Uh, um, and I also want to say something about the way that people in the academy tend to demonize a Republicans and p people in business. I mean, one of the thing. I mean, you, you know, if you're really going to uh, work on a local project, you know, and you're an English professor uh, who uh, you know, with with um, a leftist analysis, which most many of us are, um, uh, then um, uh, uh, you know. You may have to work across the lines of difference that you may think that you're really tolerant of difference with the idea that you would be in a room working on uh, working on um, uh, a community project with people who uh, who who um, voted for George Bush. This this is something that that people ha struggle with, and the same thing with working with people who uh, who are who are in business or who are in the corporate world. And I think that these are in fact intercultural. Conversations that have everything to do with negotiating very concrete realities of uh, of place, discourse, translation, and this doesn't mean that you have to agree. Um, but the, but publicness, uh, you can't pick your your community partners always on the basis of who you agree with. And so so I think so I think that while I share a lot of you know, critical energy around um, uh, the pressure on universities to become uh, 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 to become uh, corporatized. I I do think that in fact, people who are doing important administrative work in good faith within the university tend to get demonized around that agenda too easily by faculty. And, and I just think that um, encountering you know, the, one of the important things about this work is is moving into um, into um, a uh, kind of social variety uh, that's that's different from our normal our normal uh, comfort zone. This is a very low level question, but because I understand that the sort of thrust of your talk is about building institutions, um, and when you talked about this book of uh, Iowa poetry, you talked about the institutional affiliations of some of the people who were responsible. What do you think of the poems? Yeah, I, and of course, that's, I mean, that's, that's the other, you know, 62 minutes of that talk. <laughs> the poems are, um, the poems are, uh, this is the 50s. This is a, 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 an era of extraordinary poetic uh, inventiveness, Wallace Stevens, you know, so for a start. No, they no, they were not in that vein. They were much more. They were much more. Um, uh, they, they were in conventional forms. Many of them were um, were occasional poems. They were they were rhymed. They were um, uh, they weren't great. Um, 
uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and this question, and this is something that I looked at a lot in the work of Tessa Sweezy Webb in Ohio, who also was a poet and who was very, and who was reading and bringing to the attention of people in Ohio, in, in Columbus, uh, in a sometimes halting way, new Af African American poets uh, who were starting to achieve national uh, uh, reputations. She was aware of avant-garde work. She she brought it in. It's not what she wrote herself. Uh, her work was um, uh, was uh, was lyrical. Was very much focused on uh, on on positive emotion. Uh, of one kind or another on, on beauty. And I think that the craving for beauty under the night, what I would say is the 19th century category of fancy is one of the really uh, defining features of this work. And that is actually very interesting when you have all of this organizational energy producing work that is defined above, above all by a celebration of beauty itself. Uh, the social logic of that, of that claiming of beauty, um, uh, I think, in a kind of ritual way, because because so many people participated through these contests and so forth, I think is enormously interesting, and it, it makes and and that that the question of what is that desire, what is that desire. Um, um, uh, Especially when it when when the, the when the machinery of reproduction, you know, the luncheons and the, the, the newsletters and this, are, you know, generate that kind of work, I think is fascinating. And I must say, all of my 19th century uh, work pays off because I've always been obsessed with the notion of fancy and where it went. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's not something that anyone talks about anymore, but I think in some ways it still filters through our culture, and you certainly can track it through, through this work. Which, which is interested in beauty and also interested in beauty on the, on the smaller scale of fancy um, and charm, I would say. One more question? Julian, sure. I'm Kevin Ambaugh. I'm a musician. I'm a, I work a little bit in public history organizations, but now I'm a historian of German academic institutions and their relationship to broader Oh, and in my work, well, good. We can have you can you can help me think more comparatively. And, and the point in your talk where I, my mind woke up a little bit, I suppose, and I stopped just reveling in your wonderful vision was this moment where the local and the public seemed to develop a little bit of friction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in all the work I've yeah. done, all this historical work I've done, so much of the world of public culture is also at the same time the space of the expression of private legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the wonderful thing about your vision is that it takes the old bourgeois culture, the old bourgeois capital C culture of legitimation that is still living on in that 1953 volume and shares it with much, much broader communities that in a certain sense, are just learning to revel in the fact that they can express a public uh, a sensibility. The Newark Museum, the, mm -hmm. the city of Newark, I lived in New Jersey for six years, that's all, all quite in my mm -hmm. too. How do you make that tension work or think it through in your future? Well, let me give you an example of people who I think are doing some of the most interesting work, and not only the most interesting, mm -hmm. um, Practice, but some of the most interesting analysis. And I have to say, this is an organization with the absolutely awful name of the International Coalition of Historic Site Museums of Conscience. And and I'm sorry it has such an awful name because it is my favorite organization. And the the, the, the this this is one of these these <laughs> these these people who found one another. It includes the District Six Museum in Cape Town, the Tenement Museum in. Uh, in Lower Manhattan, the um, the workhouse in Britain, the Gulag uh, Museum, and an array of others in Argentina, everywhere, and um, and these were people, and they have a whole analysis of their relationship to place, 
And, th and this is a case where it's not clear that place would be necessarily the local, because the places they're talking about tend to be the places of reg the regime. <laughs> they are places, and they were places, for example, District six was, 6 was a neighborhood, but District 6 became District 6 in our political imagination because of the apartheid uh, uh, a regime. So that is a place where I certainly see tremendous, you know, considerable tension between place and the local. And, and they have a whole theory of, of, of political work, really largely speaking human rights work, but, uh, 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 but kinds of cultural education and activism and uh, uh, grappling with current crises and issues that flow out of their places. Um, uh, and um, which I'm not calling the local, but their sites. And uh, um, so that um, they, and they, when they were trying, you know, they, they were, all of these kinds of organizations were beginning to take form as, as sites like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and some of the memorial sites in Berlin, as everybody, you know, as this whole question of public memory and the, and the conflicts around public memory. We are reliving again with the Twin Towers site, um, uh, we're, we're becoming a kind of a trend uh, in an important way. And uh, so th they didn't fit into the museum world, so they, because in order to be a museum and get certified and you know, um, uh, uh, accredited and uh, you, know, you have to have air conditioning and you have to have humidity controls and you have to have collections and you have to treat your objects in a certain way and there's all this hoops you have to jump through and none of them, they, you know, they had places and they had some stuff but they weren't there and they weren't a human rights organization in the way that human rights organizations are human rights organizations because they had the, some politics of human rights organization but they didn't operate uh, that way so they went to the Ford Foundation and the Ford Foundation gave, gave Liz Sepchenko of the Tenement Museum some money and said if you can find other people who have the same problem <laughs> you can have a meeting. Um, but I, I actually think that, first of all, the, 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 the this, first of all, I think this is totally uh, uh, timely and characteristic example of how, um, of, of how globalism is working in the, in the, I would say, insurgent cultural sector, which is the people who are deeply rooted in <laughs> sort of action and, um, cultural uh, production where they are, are finding each other on the basis of their deep site-specific rootedness. That is, they're not saying, oh, uh, we're, you know, it, it, it's not like the sort of um, all the historians, you know, get together for a you know, meeting of historians, which could be at Witz in Johannesburg, or it, you know, it could be in yeah, yeah. In London, it's like these people are finding each other because they're really interested in the rootedness of each other's practice, and um, that seems to me a different premise for alliance. And the way they're building theory around this, I mean, I I, I constantly find myself going back to there to watch it, how their discourse is evolving, and I think that you know that that's a place I go for for opening up some of these tensions. Does that make sense? I'm really interested to know that you know how it all works in Germany. So you have to tell. Thank you so much.